Right here, right now, every day. CIUT 89.5 Toronto. Sound of your city. Okay, you cats and kitty cats, this is Nick Beat, and this is Hal Radio. Hope you enjoyed that track. It's an excellent song called Ball of Fire by uh, my dear friend uh, Laura LaRock. And I hope you enjoyed that. And, of course, before that, we had an interview um, uh, done by uh, Kimberly Mallet, excellently done, I might add, uh, for um, uh, for the Hawk. And the Hawk was gracious enough to let us interview him. Uh, it's a pre-recorded interview, obviously, and hopefully Kimberly and I will be interviewing him in his home in the fall, which will be incredible. So I'll be so excited about that. And uh, I hope you're excited about what we got up next. I have uh, the, another legend, really, Bob McKenzie. And I'm going to have uh, Bob's chuckling in the, in the corner now. I, I've said so. <laughs> I went a little over the top, which Canadians aren't supposed to do. But anyway, uh, Bob McKenzie is a Canadian poet and a, a novelist whose work has appeared in uh, journals, anthologies, and uh, books for almost 50 years. He's born in British Columbia, raised on the western side of southern Alberta, which I was there doing a book uh, tour years ago. And um, uh, Bob's party has appeared in hundreds of publications across uh, North America and as far away as Australia, mate, and India, including uh, Dalhousie Review, a University of uh, Windsor Review, uh, Ball State University Forum, and many, many more. He's received numerous awards for his writing, including on for On the Edge, uh, winner of the Poetry Category and International Sharp Writ Book Awards for 2012. Welcome back to Howl, Bob. It's good, good to be here. Now, you, your your books are eclectic. I mean, you've got Surprise, The Words and Vision of Bob McKenzie. You've got On Edge, which I've uh, reviewed before. And you've also got... Um, a fantastic uh, hardcover book, Spirit Quest, which is you wrote with um, a Charlena Wood. Let's let's start with Spirit Quest. What, what, what's that about, ostensibly, thematically? Okay, um, it's about mountains. It's not about. It's, say that again. It's about mountains. It's about mountains. Uh, okay. I I saw that the Banff Center had an international competition for um, for mountain books and. I, I checked with them to find out what that was. I said, okay, so what's the catch? What are the limitations? They said, nothing. I, I asked about what type of book, et cetera, nothing. They said, I said, well, what do you want? They said, as long as it's about mountains or mountain experiences, we don't care what you do. And, <laughs> and I, I'd seen Charlena's wonderful artwork before of those very mountains in the West that I grew up in. And so I approached her and said, you want to do a book? And she said, yeah. So we collaborated. She did the artwork, and I did the poetry, and um, and uh, it came out wonderfully. How do people get your books? How do people get these books? They're it's the best way. They're available online through Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com and all kinds of other wh wh whatever online booksellers there are. Um, you can ask for them at your local bookstore, but then they'll have to order them in for you. Um, and you can get this one from me or from Charlena, and we'll do you a favor and sign it. Now, do you publish other artists other than yourself? I want to. Part okay. I've, I've formed my own imprint, and part of the reason for publishing some of my own work was to get the rough edges smoothed out so that I could publish some other artists. There's There's a novelist that I keep chasing to, to give me a specific one of her manuscripts, but she hasn't yet. And I'm thinking now of doing an anthology of, of newer poets who are under-recognized so that I can get them out there as well. Okay. This is Nick B. We're talking to Bob McKenzie, uh, and he has come a far ways to get here. So really impressed again, once again that Bob is here. Bob, why don't we hear some of your work? What are you going to read first tonight? Well, I don't know. Do you want something from one of those I books? I would like, or? yeah, yeah, exactly. From I can do that. Okay, Spirit Quest especially. Spirit, Spirit Quest especially. Yeah. All right. Um, well, these um, will not have the illustrations on the radio. Well, we, we, can, <laughs> we can describe them, but I don't think that would be. Yeah. Good. Why don't we just hear the poems? And <laughs> this is Bob McKenzie on CIUT's Howl with Dick B. 
Why don't I do, there's one uh, trilogy in here um, about fire. In the, in the spring, some springs you get a bolt of lightning or something, a whole mountainside burns off. All the trees end up being just black spires. The next year it starts to regrow. The year after that you got lots of green again. It's how it's renewed. This is about that. So fire one, the end. The spark can be anything. Campfire coals left but not dead, casually tossed cigarette. Lightning touches dry forest, a seed laying among the leaves, a spark becomes a flower, colors dance across the ridge, do si do the mountain wide. Not rain but ash, this dark cloud, the frenzied dance beneath it, crackling, snapping, exploding, run, run, the living flee death, painting the forest hot hues. The spark can be anything, living, growing, rampaging, in the end, unstoppable fire. And fire two, Guernica. My dad drives slow past this scene, all ash and black spires like hell come to life on this mountain. Here there is no living thing. Once trees point up aimlessly, even the sky is gray with rain. Where the earth is not scorched black, the rest is gray and lifeless. What could possibly live here? A 12-year-old sees and thinks a sobering thought at dusk. His dad drives past this dark place. Fire 3, Awakening. Drawn in gray and black charcoal, the landscape I remember has changed since we came last spring. Even from the car, I see green tendrils climb from the ash, stretch toward the new spring sun. There are birds in the shadows, making song and making nests, high in the scorched black pine masts. On the ground, shadows take life. Rabbits and squirrels scurry, and deer stand in the clearing. And there, I think, just maybe, just maybe, I see a bear in the scene I remember, drawn in gray and black charcoal. That's Paul McKenzie you're hearing on uh, Howl Nick Beat Radio Show. Hope you're enjoying it. It's a, a spoken word show, and we also, but we also play music, especially Canadian music. And earlier you heard Laurel LaRock from her album Law of Attraction. Uh, how, how informed are you or how about today's contemporary scene as far as poetry goes? Or do you, you care about it? I'm uh, thinking more performance. I, I do care, and, and I, I follow it. Uh, I'm very familiar with the slam scene, but also with performance that is not slam, which is really where my work lies. And, um, and I, I find it very exciting because, of course, this is where poetry comes from. And, and I've, I've always been disappointed in, in words that were just meant to be on paper. Okay. I, I think that poetry should be read loud or sung. Okay. You, you look like a, a, a hippie. Is that your background in a broad sense, or am I completely off base on that? I have no idea. I don't think of myself <laughs> as a hippie. I've, I felt that the hippie movement, as created by the media, was was very idealistic. And, and um, while I would like to see a lot of the change that that movement headed for, I, I tend to think of myself more as a, a fifth column, actually doing something about things. Okay. This is Nick. We're talking to Bob McKenzie, and I hope you're enjoying uh, the interview. Uh, but why won't we hear some more of your work? Okay. Um, but while we're on this one, why don't I do one more from here, and then maybe we can switch books, okay. just because I like this one. Yeah. And it follows the other one. You'll recall we were seeing maybe bears. Yeah. Uh, this one is called Bears. Bears in Banff walk the main street, hold lunch meetings at the dump, wave and smile as we drive past, invite us to stop for lunch. Bears gather around thrown food tourists toss from car windows, my dad catching it on film out his part open window. Paws push the car window down, my dad rolls the window up, man against bear like some myth, we watch in mixed awe and fear. Returning to Two Jack Lake, we find the tent slashed by claws, food inside taken by bears, feel the chill of mountain air. 
Tourists come here to meet bears. Brown bears so cute in daylight. At night, fear bears in the dark, approaching their lamplit tents. Bears are in the camp at dusk. Stalk between tent and washrooms. Watch campers creep out in fear. Make shadow art with their paws. This Nick Peter, you're in, enjoying uh, Bob McKenzie, and uh, I hope you're enjoying his uh, poetry. See, this is kind of poetry I would never write. I would never write about Canadian subject matter. I was actually talking to KJ uh, earlier that I don't, I always write about American, American subject matter um, on a pop level for some re weird reason. I never write about Canada that, that often. Has, has that always been your subject matter direction or? Uh, my direction and my political stance as, as a poet. One, one thing that bothered me in the 60s when I was beginning was that all, maybe not all, but most of the, all the poets that came out of the Tisch movement in Vancouver and out of movements in Toronto stuff all wanted to copy American poetry movements such as the Black Mountain movement. Yeah. And, and, and they, to my ears, they were all writing American poetry. And, and, and to me, this was very damaging to Canadian poetry. So I, I studied a lot of Canadian poetry going way back and contemporary and and I wrote in that vein and continue to do so. Okay. Uh, this is Nick Pete. We're talking to Bob McKenzie. If you just joined us, uh, that's an uh, excellent answer. To uh, That's a perplexing question for me because I, I just, I don't know. I've never really written about my own country, and yet in a way I am. I mean, because we, we're so, what did Trudeau say? say he said something like, America's a big elephant that sometimes when it rolls on its back, it sort of squeezes us a little bit and you almost can't help being influenced by America. Yeah, he said it's like sleeping with an elephant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we hear some more? And I was wondering if you could read, you've got a book called On Edge, yeah. uh, the title poem from that for me. I, I, could, I really love that piece. I can do that. Thank you. You like angry poetry. Well, I'm an angry man. Angry uh, Irishman, <laughs> I should say. Oh, yeah, the Irish does it. I got a lot of Irish in me. Uh, okay, Edge. Excuse me while I do some glasses adjustment here. I have to be able to see to do this. Okay, Edge. I've been standing in the cold falling rain, hearing the pulse of its heart beat down, seeing the dark images in its shadows like the visions of ancient prophets, and I have seen that I stand in the gutter between the edges, between worlds apart, between gay and straight, between rich and poor, between capital and commune, between woman and man, between every possible polarity you can dream, looking at those edges not from the other side, but from somewhere between which is nowhere, and I have disappeared. Don't get me wrong, and don't get it twisted. It may, after all, have been only a dream. It may be I have seen nothing at all, and there was nothing at all to see in the rain, nothing but a magic shadow show played in a box, lit by sun and moon against silhouettes of rain, around which we phantom figures come and go, the rain falling like knives slicing the dark to create worlds and wash them away in a flash, lit by lightning that wakes me with a start. The words of the prophets echo down the centuries, truth, grown tired and worn until the words are only dust, choking off the little breath we gasp to survive the uncertain future we have created for ourselves. And in the words we hear echoing somewhere distant, the pulsing of a heartbeat pounding like a hammer, and feel that pulse drawing us out toward the edge. I have lived too long, too near the edge, stood too close to where it happens, seen what I should not have seen and heard it all, and hear it still in living dreams I cannot escape. There are people living on the edge. It's true. I've seen them there, clinging to the thin line between them and the other side of their reality, have stood behind them as they clung, hopeless noses pressed to some window, to some place they could not enter and I have stayed in the shadows, knowing they would not see me there. I have seen, I have seen, 
I've seen the best minds of my generation, and they are the same as those seen long ago, and they are not just America, and they are not destroyed after all, nor drag themselves through black streets, but stand waiting arm in arm to hold firm against that rough beast, its hour come round, as it slouches unrelenting through every street, seeking some holy land and preordained birth. Don't get me wrong, and... Don't get it twisted. Many people strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. But what does it matter in the end? What does it matter who is hero and who is not, when it may, after all, be only a dream? And there was nothing at all to see in the rain through which we come and go like phantoms as the rain falls like knives slicing the dark impulse of winter midnight streetlight rain creating worlds that wash away in a flash of lightning that wakes us with a start. There are people, cries in the wilderness. There are people, cries in the wilderness. There are people gathered in the streets, flooding the streets of every town and city. Cries in the wilderness of gray streets, gathered with pens and with pitchforks, crying for justice all over this land. Men and women standing arm in arm everywhere, warning of danger, crying out a warning. Cries in the wilderness. In the room, the people come and go, talking of what they have seen out there. But they don't go out there, and they, and they don't do anything to stop it. In the dark in the room, the people watch. In the silence in the room, they listen and drown a wash in flickering images and drown in the battle's sound and fury across the universe and back again, and still falls the rain like helpless tears. He stands in the shadows of the evening rain, the gentle rain that falls for years, just a little boy standing in the rain, and rain keeps falling like helpless tears. Still falls the rain with a sound like the pulse, the pulse of the heart that is changed to the hammer beat, and rain keeps falling like helpless tears. The boy disappears. Still I feel the heartbeat beating underneath everything, the pulse of the heart that is changed to the hammer beat, the pulse of the heart that hammers out love, the pulse of the heart that hammers out danger, the pulse of the heart that hammers out a warning, the pulse of the heart that hammers out hatred, while the rain keeps falling like helpless tears, while the best among us lose all conviction, while the worst grow full of passionate intensity and the heartbeat pulses behind, between everything. Don't get me wrong. Don't get it twisted. It may, after all, have been only a dream. It may be I have seen nothing at all, and there was nothing at all to see in the rain. Nothing but a magic shadow show played in a box, lit by sun and moon against silhouettes of rain, around which we phantom figures come and go, the rain falling like knives, slicing the dark to create worlds and wash them on away, away in a flash, lit by lightning that wakes me with a start. I've lived too long near the edge, stood too close to where it happens, seen what I should not have seen, and heard it all and hear it still in living dreams I cannot escape. The words of the prophets echo down the centuries, truth grown tired and worn, until the words are only dust, choking off the little breath we gasp to survive the uncertain future we have created for ourselves. And then the words we hear echoing somewhere distant, the pulsing of a heartbeat pounding like a hammer, and feel that pulse drawing us out toward the edge. Surely some revelation is at hand, cries in the wilderness between the lines. This is the way the world ends, cries in the wilderness between the lines. This is the way the world ends, cries in the wilderness between the lines. This is the way the world ends, as we stand waiting arm in arm to hold firm against that rough beast, its hour come round as it slouches, unrelenting through every street, seeking some holy land and preordained birth, and some ancient anarchy is loosed upon the world. But don't distress yourself with dark imaginings. No doubt the universe is unfolding as it should, and the dark, you see, is only rain falling. Too long living not on the edge like some, too long living in the gutter flows between the edges where the shadows flow, between the ages, able to see the dark, see the dark that consumes their lives. I'm with you in Rockland, he shouts out loud, cries from the wilderness with conviction. Is anybody out there? Does anybody hear him? Is Rockland just another dream in the dark, his voice an echo of something that is no more? A cry in the wilderness between the lines. I'm with you in Rockland, fades in the distance. His voice disappears. 
but don't get me wrong and don't get it twisted. It may, after all, have been only a dream. It may be that I've seen nothing at all and there was nothing at all to see in the rain and I have disappeared. This is Nick Pete. You're listening to Bob McKenzie. By the way, our shows within 24 hours are archived and you can actually download this show and hear the entire show in its entirety. Isn't that a nice tautological thing I just said? In its entirety. Anyway, thanks, Bob, so much. Uh, we're going to play Bob's from uh, his album at the end of the show as an outro um, from an album called uh, War, Peace, and Love, and we're going to play a track from that. Bob, one more time before we bring John in for our interview, how do people get your books and buy them? Online at any of the major booksellers, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, any other, and um, you can get them from me or, or the one book from Charlena as well, but it's easier to just go to the online bookseller. And if people want to approach you for publication, can they do that now, or are you still tentative about it about that? Oh, no, absolutely. I've, I've had people approach me, just nobody that I wanted to publish yet. The ones <laughs> okay. I wanted to publish haven't. <laughs> You're <agreed>. honest. <laughs> I like that. Bob, thanks so much for coming into Howl again. It's great thank, to see thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. That was a beautiful reading, by the way. Oh, thank you. We're going to have uh, now as an outro Bob McKenzie's piece from uh, War, Peace, and Love. Enjoy. And upcoming is Sex City's Nick Beat. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Nothing can
destroyed by all your betrayal.